Dobrý den, dámy a pánové. U prosincové debaty vás vítá zakladatel Alter Eco, globální strateg Roman Chlupatý. Dnes se zaměříme výzvy, kterým bude čelit střední a východní Evropa v roce 2022. Mým hostem je Rafaela Tenkony, zakladatelka ADA Economics, londýnské společnosti a také členka analytického týmu Alter Eco. Rafaela, hello and welcome. Hello, everyone. Challenges, if not problems, abound. So, first question: How likely it is, do you think, that uh, Central and Eastern Europe or some of its economies will actually face, if not crisis, then tumultuous economic situation in the 2022? I think in 2022 you could see some. Uh, meaningful slowdown, especially in the Czech Republic, because is the country that is going more forcefully in monetary tightening and could also face uh, some echoes from the German slowdown. But generally, I think it is going to be still a year of expansion with some uh, ec- some fairly meaningful volatility on currencies in the unfavorable side for Hungary and Poland. So you you have two problems essentially. One is relatively short term, which is linked to supply chain production and cars and temporary things. And one should be considered more profound, which is the exchange rate trajectory. You've mentioned a couple of things, issues that obviously make a lot of sense to be discussed, uh, look at them in detail. Uh, let's go one by one, choose at least some of the things that are definitely uh, a theme for discussion. Uh, first and foremost, probably given the current situation, COVID. Let me say wild card. What do you expect, given the current situation, lockdowns in some of the Central and Eastern European countries, as well as in Austria, Germany and other places? Uh, how is it going to play with the economy? How is it going to impact the economy next year? And of course, it's a great unknown because we know that COVID is here. We know that governments are most likely going to do something about it. But what and how it's going to translate into economic growth or slowdown, we don't know. Well, I think you need to think about COVID in a different way from the past year and a half. Because the the economic and healthcare situation has evolved since. We do have vaccines and we clearly are going towards the direction where it will be compulsory or de facto compulsory to have the third shot, the fourth shot, the fifth shot, and so on and so forth. So it is not nearly as alarming and not nearly as destructive as it was in 2020. So in the near term, you are facing some restrictions, but from our point of view, a lot of it should have been expected. And it's part of the theme that, of course, tourism, airlines, you know, catering, anything that requires social interaction is on a relatively slow and bumpy recovery. It is still a recovery, but it's bumpy. So in many respects, it's not a dramatic concern to me. It's it's certainly a problem, a human problem, but it's not. But the economy in, in, in the grand scheme of things is not a major change. But it has a different angle now because the vaccine itself is very controversial right and has governments are going to go and get tougher on vaccinations there are people that were already skeptical and those that might not have been as skeptical but generally do not share this approach that are going to build mistrust Okay, mistrust for an economy is a very expensive and subtle change. It means higher cost of capital and it means higher effects volatility. And I'm talking about broad trends, right? It's not that this needs to happen tomorrow, but it's extremely important 
uh, to keep in mind, essentially. So I think COVID is in this phase co contributes to this worrying trends of mistrust towards institutions, which has other aspects, and it's certainly compounded by digitalization, and it's certainly compounded by the fact that we have very high inflation, and in some countries, a mixture of denial and I don't know what to do about it <laughs> kind of policy approach. Do you see bubbles uh, and let me go back to uh, housing market, even though it's not the only one where prices seem quite, quite high. Uh, do you see bubbles somewhere, bubbles that might pop and actually trigger, if not recession, then economic problems? Uh, economic problems, by that I mean something that actually translates into real economy, not doesn't stay necessarily on the market as such. In Central Europe, I wouldn't necessarily say you're really in a fundamentally overvalued housing market. The housing market has some pockets of excessive euphoria and certainly in the capitals. Uh, in Hungary, it's not just the capital now, it's, it's happening in other cities. Um, but I would say that, that if you have an asset of that kind, just brace yourself for higher volatility. So when we do tip into global recession, you know, your price, your house may be going down 20% in value, but it's going to be relatively temporary because in Central Europe, overall, I think these economies are still well positioned to converge up across the income distribution for the next 10 years. So as long as you manage your debt or you're proactively refinance and you know you really pay attention to this i don't think you're stuck with a bad asset now of course over time that may be but right now no a lot of the problems are in the developed economies actually where you know that push of wage going up across the income distribution is not there but the push for higher interest rates, uh, sorry, for higher housing valuation is there. So maybe pay attention if you're thinking about investing abroad or if your client is in one of these troubled spots. Repetitively, we got to inequality, increasing inequality, polarization or fragmentation in society as well as in the real economy, the differences between big and small, uh, let's say, companies that are involved with modern economy and companies that are more traditional, the, the, the differences are increasing. Do you, do you consider it one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge, possibly risk at the moment? Uh, for instance, Ray Dalio, spoke two or two and a half years ago before COVID came about this kind of polarization, fragmentation, being much bigger threat to him than the next recession or any other economic challenge because it translates both into economy and into a broader picture, meaning the connections between people, between, uh, between economic subjects, which of course then, and you mentioned it at the beginning, can uh, make the whole structure, the whole economy, uh, work uh, in a way that is not not only perfect but is very complicated, slow, costly, and as such, of course, difficult. Absolutely. I mean, I think inequality, or rather, structural inequality, is the problem that we need to discuss. But before I explain why, I want to make clear something. Because when you talk about inequality, you trigger usually two reactions, right? One is a kind of human reaction, of course, you know, it, you know, you think about the poor little kids in Africa. I mean, that certainly is the picture that was ingrained in me since I was small. And therefore you have a, a soft human reaction, but when you then translate it into business, you know, people don't 
really see it as a priority. They don't see it, why is it important? Now, I want people to not think about household income inequality for the purpose of business, okay? It's a distraction. Let's not do that. The problem that we face here is corporate inequality, which is related to households, but it's a much more pressing issues. And corporate inequality links very, very clearly with competition. And competition is the salt of economic growth. If you don't have competition, you're not going to have prosperity. You are not going to have stability of institution. It's going to be very, very difficult to build a successful business. So the, the problem that I have in this historical moment, which is very special relative to anything that we've seen before, is that the combination of persistent QE, globalization, and this technological leap structurally undermines the competitive environment everywhere. Of course, different countries exposed in different ways, but that is the fundamental issue. And the other thing that it does is that it really undermines human capital in many ways, you know. And through an uneven distribution of information, knowledge, and the ability to really build professional skills, it undermines the productivity and the supply of labor that ultimately you need as a business owner. So when I say we are facing an inflation trend and we don't know how to tackle it, this is what I have in mind, that you are essentially creating a system that globally continues to channel too much liquidity into relatively few assets, which are now creating enormous cascading inflationary problems elsewhere. And you're starving the majority of resources that could be better deployed to actually provide supply, provide it at competitive price, you know, and generally generate prosperity. Because for prosperity, you need the majority of people to be better off. Otherwise, the math doesn't add up. <laughs> um, so, so this, I think, is really the, the biggest challenge. Many people are disappointed. Uh, they are either starting to or they don't anymore believe in the system and the ability of the system to take care of them. And that, 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 that applies not only for individuals, households, but also business people who feel the same for the same or, or similar reasons, as you said, that the game is skewed. And, and thusly, the demand for things that are outside the system grows. One of them, Bitcoin or more generally crypto. What is uh, the economist take on the subject matter? Is it a threat to a system? Is it going to undermine the monetary system that still provides for stability, at least in the West? Or is it an interesting supplement, uh, a piece of a puzzle of the word to be that uh, will actually be improved? Well, as of today, given the policy intelligence that we have and the policy preferences that we have, there is no doubt to me that blockchain assets, so that means crypto, it means tokenization and all of its other deployments, is going to destabilize financial system over time because some people are disillusioned, as you said. Uh, some people are afraid of inflation and capital controls. Some people just find it a good asset to invest because, you know, you need something to invest. And so you're structurally channeling liquidity into this universe, which is still very small. And so it's a self-reinforcing mechanism, right? Because you don't need a lot of investment to make it go up. And so it will attract more investment. Um, and yet, you you know, policymakers are in total denial. 
we don't measure it properly, we don't acknowledge it properly, we don't want to even understand how it fits. So as of today, it clearly is going to be destabilizing. And I link this to what we discussed earlier on, the mistrust into these institutions, it's shaping itself into many different ways. Some of it is traditional dollarization, right? Some of it is going to go into blockchain assets. And the you see the numbers already. You see the, you know, the assets going shifting and you see currencies beginning to reflect that. What does it mean for businesses in Central and Eastern Europe? You tour the region regularly, you meet people from the SMEs in the region. Are they ready? Are they interested? Should they be interested? Are you, as a business person, interested in using, not only following, but using or understanding this technology? Well, we certainly invest uh, in, into understanding it, into predicting how we will fit in. Personally, we invest in uh, crypto because, I mean, to be honest, <laughs> it makes no sense not to do that <laughs> right now. But conscious of the fact that, you know, my job is to signal when something is deviating from its fundamental value, and it can still be a very good investment as long as you're aware that it's probably not going to perform like that for, for a while. So, yes, we do invest um, financially and intellectual capital in, in understanding it. We think that penetration of fintech, it's still in early days, but you will see an exponential rise. In Central Europe, the bigger problem that I see is the is the growing distrust into governments. You know, if you are affiliated or simply supporting the opposition, it's clear that there are some questions in your mind and therefore you're trying to find a way to hedge. So in Central Europe, and this affects mostly Hungary and Poland, but it will not be completely leave on scattered Czech Republic, but uh, Hungary and Poland are facing a depreciation trajectory that at this stage is very palatable and goes beyond what normal fundamentals would say. Um, but going forward, I do notice other countries, especially those where credit, bank credit is being too tight, being restricted, companies looking at fintech solutions as a way to finance themselves. Because the other paradox that we are facing now is that in the last two decades, we have regulated the banking sector so much that you're not allowing the banking sector to do what normally it's meant to do, which is release credit, perhaps a bit too much on the upside, and then facilitate budget financing through bond holdings on the downside. It's a necessity, it's the way it works. If you constrain the banking sector this way, the system will find another way and it has found blockchain. So I think, I think what is important to keep in mind is that especially when you think about public debt, responsibility and sustainability, the easy short-term solution is to think about purely the financing of the public debt and that is a technical skill okay but in the longer term public debt is a function of how much investment you want to put in your own citizens across the spectrum right because that is the asset that you have whereas we are putting too much emphasis on the actual public debt ratio and of course, population is telling you that you're underinvesting in their future and therefore they will find some other way to hedge themselves. To sum it up, and we're going back to square one, the central question meaning central and eastern Europe or the economies from the region of the CE in 2022. First, the macro take, if you will, on the subject matter. If you had to order the economies in the CE region, 
uh, according to their potential to, to withstand all the challenges we discussed and possibly more, what would the ranking look like? What is the best situated or what are the best situated uh, and worst situated economies at the moment? In terms of GDP performance overall, Hungary is the best one. It also has an enormous fiscal stimulus in the pipeline. Um, and, and overall, definitely the best positioned. I would put second Poland uh, on a mixture of still fiscal and monetary stimulus. And last one, the Czech Republic. But because you asked me about 2022, and of course that is a relatively short snapshot. Right. And the market take, if you will, on the subject matter, meaning, uh, you know, what do you, what do you expect from currencies, pot possibly stocks in general? I think um, biggest exchange rate risks are in Hungary and Poland. I am tempted to rank Huff as the most vulnerable uh, because it does have a very conflicted election and relatively low interest rates. So that's where you could see the biggest uh, deviation of the currency. Poland is right behind it. In the case of Poland, the central bank has ample intervention scope. So that creates volatility rather than a one-way street. But it's certainly true that the dispute with the EU and the judicial system is, is to be taken very seriously. And it will reflect itself into currency. Czech Republic, I think the currency is very well anchored and you may as well see it appre appreciating. In terms of stock market performance, um, I would rank it slightly differently in the sense that Hungary could still perform well in terms of stock market as long as your local currency investor. Okay. Uh, uh, Poland and Czech Republic, I would say they face challenges of different nature. Uh, so in terms of stock market, I don't have high expectations. But in the Czech Republic, I would say that once you actually see, and if you see the economy getting towards recession, then that could be a good time to begin thinking about investing in the stock market because the central bank will reverse quickly. And there is nothing wrong with this country, actually. Uh, so it's purely a, 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 a policy decision on timing. Whereas in Poland, I have to be skeptical because until the dispute with the EU is settled, then I am not sure you're getting enough bang for the buck, so to speak. To byla prosincová alter eco debata. Mým hostem byla zakladatelka ADA Economics londýnské společnosti Rafaela Tenkony. Rafaela mimo jiné je členkou analytického týmu Alter Eco. Rafaela, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. A to je pro letošní rok z Alter Eco dílny vše. Těšíme se na spolupráci a vaši přízeň v příštím roce. Vše dobré do roku 2022 vám přeje zakladatel Altereko a globální strateg Roman Chupatý.